In this video, we'll review some basic principles of linear algebra. Because linear algebra is a prereq for this class, I hope this is mostly review. We'll start by reviewing the basic interpretation of matrices. Then, we'll review some things which determine the existence and uniqueness of solutions to linear systems. Let's start with the interpretation of matrices. Let's say we have m simultaneous linear equations, each with n unknowns. Note that each unknown is linear. All the x's are only raised to the 1 power, and none of the x's are encased in a trig or log function. That's what makes these equations linear. It sounds limited, and it is to a degree, but an amazing amount of engineering analysis can be cast in terms of linear algebra. Even nonlinear systems of equations can be closely approximated by linear systems of equations. We can condense these linear equations into vectors and matrices. The A matrix holds the coefficient of each unknown. The A matrix has m rows and n columns. The x vector is the vector of unknowns. It has m rows and one column. Similarly, the B vector has m rows and one column. The equations which constitute the A matrix, B vector, and x vector typically come from the laws of physics. In most linear algebra problems, we know the A matrix and B vector, but we need to find the X vector. There are many different ways we can obtain X. We can row reduce, compute A inverse if it exists, decompose the A matrix into LU or QR form, and so forth. Later on, we'll focus on how specifically to compute X. For now, the critical takeaway is that there are many different methods we can employ to actually find X. It's important to understand the physical interpretation of A, B, and X. The A matrix represents the system's parameters. The system's attributes, like its geometry, thermal conductivity, material properties, spring constants, and so forth, are contained within the A matrix. Each entry of the A matrix represents how parts of the system interact. The B vector represents the forcing functions. Basically, we apply some stimulus to our system. In a mechanics problem, the B vector could represent the forces we apply. In a circuit problem, the B vector could be the voltage sources. In a thermo problem, it could be how much we're heating. These constitute the right-hand side of each of the M equations. Finally, the X vector represents the system's response. We're interested in knowing how things change when we apply the stimuli from the B vector. We might want to know what the force on a joint is when we apply an external force. Or we might want to know what the current in a particular branch of a circuit is upon applying a voltage. In a thermo problem, the X vector probably contains the temperatures we want to measure. Here's a simple circuit problem to demonstrate the cause-effect relationship. We want to find the current in each branch when we apply a 200 volt voltage source. The current in each branch will vary depending on the resistances. The actual amount of current flowing in each branch can be computed via Ohm's law, KVL, and KCL. Sometimes you'll be asked to derive the system of equations. Other times, we'll just give it to you. Let's skip the derivation part for now, although you're welcome to try and obtain this system on your own. The A matrix contains the values of the resistances and the assumed directions of the currents from KVL and KCL. The X vector represents the magnitudes of the currents, and the B vector represents the sole 200 volt voltage supply. This is a pretty large system, and it definitely takes a while to derive it. It can be pretty easy to make a mistake. I contend that linear algebra isn't computationally hard. Rather, the hard part is getting these matrices. Now that we've discussed the physical interpretation of a linear system, let's discuss a more geometric interpretation. A system can be interpreted using either the rows or columns. In the row interpretation, we treat each equation as a standalone entity. We graph each equation and find the point of intersection. This point represents the solution to both of these equations. This is the most intuitive way of interpreting a system of equations. A non-intuitive but equally valid interpretation is the column interpretation. Here, we assign each column to one of the unknowns. Each column represents a vector in space. I like to superimpose a polar plot onto the coordinate axis for the column interpretation. This line represents 30 degrees, this is 60 degrees, this is 90 degrees, and so forth. The objective is to see how we can form the black B vector by linearly combining the red and the blue vectors. It turns out that if we shrink the blue vector by a factor of 0.8, 
and then we stretch the red vector by a factor of 1.6, they will combine to form the B vector. It's not a coincidence that we get the same answer as the row interpretation. Whether you use the row or column interpretation is up to you. You definitely need to understand both, but you can use whichever one is easier for you. Now that we learned ways to interpret a system of equations, let's talk about the solution. After all, that's why we form linear systems in the first place. But solutions aren't always guaranteed to exist, so how do we know if they do? A critical concept is linear independence, or I guess linear dependence, depending on what you want to call it. We say that the A matrix is linearly independent if you cannot form any column from a linear combination of the other columns. Alternative ways of assessing linear independence is if A has a pivot in each row, if the determinant of A is non-zero, and so forth. On the left here, we have one A matrix and its column interpretation. In this case, we don't care about the B vector since linear independence is a property of just the A matrix. Notice how there's no possible scaling factor we can apply to the red vector to make the blue vector because it points in a different direction. Because we can't possibly make the red vector from the blue vector or the blue vector from the red vector, we say that this matrix is linearly independent. Or more precisely, we say that the columns of A are linearly independent. On the right, we have a different A matrix. If we plot both columns, it's apparent that they both point in the same direction. That means we can express one vector as a multiple of the other vector. This means that the columns of this A matrix are linearly dependent. Here are some more definitions. The rank is defined as the number of linearly independent columns of our A matrix. An A matrix is said to be full rank if the rank of A equals the number of columns of A. For example, if A is 2 by 2 and its rank is 2, then A is full rank. But if A only has one linearly independent column, then the rank of A equals 1, and we say it's rank deficient. The consistency of a system characterizes whether a system of equations has solutions. First, we need to form the augmented A matrix, A tilde. This is just the A matrix and the B vector concatenated horizontally. If the rank of A equals the rank of A tilde, then the system is consistent and we know at least one solution exists. Else, the system is inconsistent and there's no solution. To recap, solutions exist if the system is consistent. To determine consistency, we need to know the ranks of A and A tilde. To know the rank, we need to understand linear independence. This is how they're all related. I know I just threw a lot of definitions at you, so let's do an example to clarify some things. Given this particular system, we want to find the rank of A, A tilde, and the system's consistency. We have a 2 by 2 A matrix, so we could do all of this by hand. For brevity, it's best to do this in MATLAB. To find the rank of A, I entered the A matrix into MATLAB, then row reduced it using the RREF function, which I'll link to in the video description. We can see from the row reduce echelon form that we have a pivot in each row, so each of the columns of A is linearly independent. That means the rank of A is 2. We can confirm this using the rank function. Now we need to find the rank of A tilde. I used the rank function again, but this time I told MATLAB to find the rank of the augmented A matrix. Since the rank of A tilde is also 2, the system is consistent and at least one solution exists. Note that this doesn't tell us what the solution is, only that there's at least one solution. Here's another example. This system is the linearly dependent system from slide 13, so we know there can't be any solutions. Let's verify this in MATLAB. After row reducing, it's evident that column 2 is 1.5 times column 1, so we know that the columns of A are linearly dependent, as previously confirmed. This means that the rank of A is only 1. The rank of A tilde is also 2, so the two ranks are unequal and the system is inconsistent. Geometrically, this means we can never form this specific B vector. By now, we've covered the existence of solutions. Now pretend we have a consistent system, so at least one solution exists. Now we want to know if there's only one solution or if there are multiple. We already know that in order to have at least one solution, the ranks of A and A tilde must match. But to determine if we have one or multiple solutions, we compare the rank of A to N. 
If the rank of A is the same as N, we only have one solution. If not, we have infinite solutions. And of course, we know this must be true if there are no solutions. This is the consistent system we saw in slide 15. Now we want to determine if there's one or multiple solutions. The rank of A is 2 and N is 2, which is the number of columns in A, so we have a unique solution. To find what the solution actually is, we can row reduce A tilde. There are other ways we could find what the solution is, but for now, I'll just use RREF. Upon doing so, we learned that the unique solution is x equals 0.8 and y equals 1.6. And here's the inconsistent system from earlier. We can row reduce A tilde and get a nonsensical answer. In fact, it doesn't even make sense for us to row reduce A tilde because we know there's no solution. So far, we've looked primarily at square systems, in particular 2x2 two two systems. But linear systems don't always need to be square. If we have more equations than unknowns, our system is said to be overdetermined. In an overdetermined system, we generally cannot satisfy all the equations at once. Therefore, we have to turn to some optimization method. Perhaps the most popular optimization technique is called least squares regression. Here, we have an overdetermined system because we have three equations but only two unknowns, x and y. The row interpretation of the system produces three straight lines. The solution to this overdetermined system is the point where all three lines intersect, which doesn't exist. But after we apply a least squares regression, it turns out that the optimal solution is where the star is here. It's interesting that despite being the optimal solution, the star isn't located on any of the places where two lines intersect, and that's on purpose. We'll learn how to numerically obtain these values later on in the linear algebra unit when we cover least squares regression. Now let's examine the case when we have more unknowns than equations. This kind of system is called underdetermined. Because we don't have as many equations as we do constraints, we generally end up with infinite solutions because we will end up assuming one of the variables is free. For example, take this system down here. The equation is x plus y equals 2, and we need to find the x and y which satisfy this equation. But there are infinitely many combinations of x and y which sum to 2. Underdetermined systems are prevalent in the field of integer programming, which is basically another optimization method. Integer programming is well studied in the industrial engineering field. To summarize, the first part of this lecture reviewed the physical and geometric interpretations of the linear algebra problem ax equals b. In particular, the b vector represents the forcing functions exerted upon the system. The a matrix captures the properties of the system, and the x vector contains the response variables. We then pivoted to discussing the existence and uniqueness of solutions. The linear independence, rank, and consistency of a system determine the existence and uniqueness of solutions. I hope everything in this lecture was a review. This is a reminder to review your linear algebra notes even if you understood everything. The invariable matrix theorem is a great resource to review because it lists all of the ways you can tell if a matrix can be inverted. It can give you a refresher on the various ways you can evaluate a matrix not only for invertibility but for other things like linear independence as well. See you next time.